I'd like to uh, call this Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to order uh, Wednesday, February 10th at 7 p.m. Uh, roll call. Jeff Belter. Daniel Alder. Sam Solars. Charles Smallwood. Justin Emery. Sean Cuff. Jessica Boniwell. And stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the, the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to get approval of the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the amended agenda as it is. I'll was, second. Was that was that was you made the and who seconded? Okay, thank yeah. you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, make a motion for approval of the minutes of the January thirteenth, twenty twenty one Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 And we're looking for an election for officer for chair. Um, Mr. Mike Scanlon has resigned from planning and zoning, and he was the chair, so we have to appoint a new chair. I did speak to Mr. Emery yesterday, and he would like to continue on as vice chair. Um, and Mr. Smallwood has done the chair position before in planning and zoning. So, and he is willing to do it if you see fit. I'll make a motion to appoint uh, Mr. Smallwood as chair. I'll second. In favor say aye. 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 Okay. Cheers. Gee, thanks. <laughs> Okay, we've got two public hearings tonight. I'm just going to be looking for uh, one motion to open and close them. Um, the uh, conditional use permit at 111 Buffalo Avenue South is the first public hearing. Do I hear a motion to? I'll make a motion to close the uh, planning and zoning commission meeting and open the public hearing. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, at 7.05, open our first public hearing. I'll turn it over to uh, city staff. Sure. Uh, Sid Chandler has uh, submitted an application for a conditional use permit for his property located at uh, 111 Buffalo Avenue South. The property is owned residential business, which is intended for a transitional use and land use from residential to low intensity business and will allow for mixing of these uses. He's open, and he can uh, correct me if I'm wrong with this, but open a firearms restoration business with limited sales traffic. Um, they have noted that the firearms will be safe and are, sorry, secured via a safe, and they will have a safety security system in place. Also, this is contingent upon him getting his federal firearms license, and then that is pending this decision as well. Um, a conditional use permit, um, is allowed in an RB zone for merchant and commercial activity as he is applied for. Um, the applicant will need to screen the adjacent residential properties around it. Um, the screening would just be like uh, trees and bushes, etc., like that. Um, I do have in here a condition for parking, but due to the fact that he has indicated that it is very low tra traffic, um, it would be more that he needs to provide a proof of parking that it would fit eight stalls, not that he needs to put it in right now. No. The reason being that since the CUP runs with the property, after he leaves, the use would still be there and they would be allowed to, at which time when the new applicant comes in, if they had that actual retail demand, they would need to put in the required number of spaces, which could be determined also at that time too. But um, Let's see here. I do have a public hearing email that I want to just submit into record. Um, let's see here. This is from uh, Miss Kelly Warner. She lives at 130 Buffalo Avenue South. 
Uh, let's see here. Mr. Chantlin owns property on all sides of her property, and she is worried about creating tension between being a neighbor to his properties. Um, concerned about the building's proximity to the elementary school, the park nearby, and the community center, and is wondering if there's any restrictions about how close a business such as that could be to those properties. Also concerned about the security of the building in general, as she is worried about people breaking in to steal the guns. Obviously unable to attend the meeting, but wanted to have her concerns known. Now I can address some of those questions that she had. Um, the city does not have the ability to zone a firearms usage such as this. That would be kind of federal jurisdiction, and so we cannot do anything about that. No. Staff has uh, recommended approval of the uh, permit based upon the conditions that I put into the report. And Mr. Chatland is in attendance tonight to answer any questions that you may have. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Anything additional? I have nothing additional at the moment. Okay. If anybody has any public hearing comments. Um, does anybody in the public want to speak to this? Um, the, 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 the CUP at 111 Buffalo Avenue, if you want to speak to this, you'll come up to the podium. You have to state your name and your address and say it slowly and clearly for the minutes. Okay? Okay. Is there anything you wanted to say, Sid? Um, I guess it's not, you know, the, the ATF, uh, they describe, it, they say manufacturing, but it's not manufacturing like in people's mind. Oh, they think manufacturing is not going to be a making parts and spitting out guns or it's just restoring antique guns and getting them back in the legal system that's why the ATF is involved so so I can have a federal firearms license and do it legally and above board and there's a bank vault that's going to be installed down there I already own the bank vault and it's uh, everything's here already and it's been here for 20 plus years so the security of it is I guess been good so far <laughs> okay Anybody have any questions for him? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Sid. Okay. Uh, I'd look for a motion to close the meeting, the right. public hearing, and vote. I think, I th do we want to make a motion? Do you guys want to, do they want to discuss it and make a recommendation to the council, or do you want to wait till the end of both public hearings? I think we want to close the public hearing. Go ahead. Close it. I figure we just do two public hearings back to back. Okay, is anybody looking to make a motion to close the uh, public hearing and open the uh, commission's meeting? Planning and zoning. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing, Part A, and reopen the planning and zoning commission meeting. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, seven, eleven. Okay. Okay. And I'd be looking for a motion in regards to considering the conditional use permit at 111 Buffalo Avenue South. I say I'd be looking for a motion to on the consideration of the conditional use permit for 111 Buffalo South. If you're okay with it, just remember you can you can only make a recommendation to the city council. That's what your motion is, and then they will make a decision at their March eighth meeting. I propose to let them do it. I don't know what the right wording is, but I'm I'm all for it. In a second. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Carries four zero. Okay, John, I'm looking for a motion to close the planning and zoning and open the uh, second public hearing, consideration of planned unit development, staging, recognizing, or rezoning. I'll put my damn glasses back on. 
stage rezoning and preliminary plat application east end of Steamboat Lane. Uh, before you, you guys have an application from Loomis Development for uh, 14 single family homes. Uh, the lot property is located off of Steamboat and Plate and was originally part of the Rolling Meadows second edition that was approved back in, I believe, 2004, of which this was known as Outlot C. Um, and it was ghost platted at that time for nine single family homes. Uh, the property itself is actually uh, zoned R1, and the development, or the applicant, has requested several flexibility on the following uh, lot size, lot width, side yard setbacks, um, of which the lot size, the average size that they're requesting is about 7,500 square feet, with about a minimum of, I believe, 6,868 6, square feet. Um, lot width standard for R1 districts is 80 feet, and the minimum that they'd be requesting on these is 52 feet. Uh, the side yard setback standard for R1 is 10 feet, and in this one, the minimum that they would be requesting is 5 feet. Um, the applicant will need to provide a landscape plan, and they have already met their requirements for the park dedication. That was fulfilled via the Second Meadows addition already because they dedicated land towards this. Um, they will be required, though, to meet the side yard setback requirements on the lots that are adjacent to previous developments that are zoned R1. Specifically, um, I believe in one of the exhibits you can see that it would be Lot 1, Lots 1 and 6, and Block 2, Lots 1 and 8. Uh, specifically, those need to meet 10-foot requirements, and two of the proposed houses would not meet that requirement, so they'll just need to make sure that they meet those requirements, and those can be confirmed when they're doing the building and everything on that. Um, staff would just say that this is kind of a policy decision on regards to how much flexibility that you want to give the applicant um, for this development. Um, and if you guys have any questions on this, let me know. Uh, in the packets, I didn't see anything from Kevin Triplett. Uh, pardon me? From the fire chief? Nothing from the fire chief, no. Okay. Usually you had the input. And I, I don't know, um, Daniel, maybe you want to spend just a moment explaining to the audience what a PUD means. Uh, so the state statutes allow for a planned unit development, which is essentially to allow cities to provide flexibility to their zoning. Um, and it allows the city to work with a developer who usually will provide something back in the form of you know, um, higher landscaping standards or higher standards of housing. Um, to allow for that reducement of the flexibility, which in this case would be the setbacks and the lot sizes. And so generally it is done via rezoning. It can be done by a conditional use permit, but that is generally not how it is done these days um, because this would be considered a rezoning of the district. And so this will allow for, like I said, more flexibility for the stoning standards up to and only up to the point of which you want to allow the flexibility. Okay. Works. Open to the public. Mm -hmm. Anyone have anything they would uh, like to say about this? Please step up to the podium. Give your name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Kurt Anderson. I live at 802 Steamboat Lane. Um, I was just wondering if the uh, if the amount of flexibility that we offer will still allow for the owners of the houses to um, park their recreational vehicles alongside the houses like most other people do. I believe that would be on a case-by-case case basis, but I believe essentially it might have to be on just one side of the house if that was going to be allowed, just uh -huh. due to the fact that in general there would be 10 feet between each of the homes, and that the recreational one can go up to, I believe it is, within five feet of the property line, so that could probably be allowed. It just wouldn't have to be on the same side. And, that, and they would be required to follow our recreational 
vehicle parking ordinance um, that was adopted in 2017. It would have to be on a hard service that's approved by our engineer. Right. Well, I used to be on planning and zoning a couple of years ago. Mm. And um, I seem to recall that Whitetail had that same issue, that uh, some of the houses were so close together that they couldn't park their vehicles and things. Uh, I'm not aware of that. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, that's fine. It's something that we have, definitely have to look into. It might have to be a requirement that that's not allowed to if they are too close, and that would be part of the flexibility that I would think, be allowed. Yeah. I think that's what we did at Whitetail, too. Okay. Because it wasn't from. from yeah, that's a recommendation that you can make to the city council, too. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Here. And uh, I live, I'm Roger Froman, and I live in 921 Aspen Lane. And so the, uh, the this property would be in the view of my kitchen window, so to speak. I mean, you know, so I'm not immediately adjacent to it. I'm across Aspen from it. Um, but I will make the following observations uh, for consideration for the, the board or for the uh, zoning uh, team here. The um, first, we're looking at, uh, I've lived almost four years, and as we eat breakfast, we see a lot of traffic that comes down steam, that, that segment of the steamboat, and makes the corner, and uh, there's nine homes living on that segment of steamboat today. And we have school buses and uh, short buses for, for one of the children, uh, as well as the delivery vehicles, as well as, uh, on an average, two cars per household. So if we uh, approve this as designed, we're looking at a couple of key issues. Number one is that when the Randy's uh, trash truck comes uh, down Aspen and makes the corner into Steamboat Lane, it goes up and then has to turn around in the little uh, turnaround point there on the elbow of the lane, and then back up the rest of Steamboat Lane because it's a dead end, right? There's just no turnaround up there. But with this proposal, it's one of the three parcels of property, not all three, and the original plotted route of Steamboat Lane would require purchasing all three and completing Steamboat Lane so that it's double-ended, right? So the traffic could go in both directions. With this, traffic is, all 23 houses will empty in, into that one road. And if the cul-de-sac is not a complete cul-de-sac up at the end of this thing, school buses and trash trucks and delivery vehicles and everything else will have a dickens of a time going up there, turning around and coming back down. So the number one thing is, is it's got to be, it has to be a complete cul-de-sac. But number two, from a zoning standpoint, anytime you're working with dead ends that long, the steamboat is, and it's, and it's two parts of the steamboat that are broken with these three pieces of property. So ideally, what we'd like to see is for all three partials and build on all three of those partials and complete steamboat so that it's a throughway. And that way we can have confidence that the utilities, the water main, is going to be continuous from both ends. And so we don't end up with a single end of utility line, water line, going up there. And the same thing with gas and et cetera. So from a city planning standpoint, the more double-ended things are, the better it is, both from a traffic standpoint, you know, fire access, all that kind of stuff, but also from a utility standpoint. And that's the biggest concern is that anytime you have fire hydrants on a, on a, on a dead end rather than on a loop, the fire chief will tell you right off, give me double-ended, right? So that's uh, okay. 
And so the traffic goes from nine homes to 23 homes total. And that's a huge d- delta that's impact at that point, which happens to be also a bus stop. But now the uh, uh, other things that, uh, you know, all the trees are going to be that are currently on that hillside, because the lot sizes are made smaller, the trees have to be removed. And so we end up with a, you know, a big impact as far as uh, having that bluff with no trees. Now, the other uh, things is that the, each of the homes are with, at best, two-car garage, right? Or a large one-car garage. Now, I grew up where two pennies were, were pretty dear, right? Um, and having a two-car garage is a complete luxury, except when where do you put the lawnmower? And with the plan as proposed, we have the smaller garages and the reduced lot size, up to you know, 10, 11 feet between buildings, maybe 13, 14 per, uh, between buildings. Mm-hmm. Now we're talking about storing the lawnmower somewhere. And if it isn't going to fit in a garage, not readily, especially if people have two cars, then you run into a problem of yard size has been reduced on you as well. Yeah. So it's a compromise in two directions, which makes it really tough. I've been there. I've done that. It's really tough to yeah. have that kind of situation. Okay. Um, okay. We limit it to three minutes so everybody has a chance. Okay. So, well, thank you. Fair enough. Did you want to comment on any of that? Did you want to comment on any anyone else that'd like to uh, say anything? I could comment on the cul-de-sac issue. The engineer has addressed that in their letter. It would be uh, point number seven that the applicant would need to redesign the uh, cul-de-sac there to accommodate that issue. That would come right through. That's why I was asking if we had the fire chief. Report because he would have called that out and the uh, mm-hmm. side setbacks. And, he's saying they need to buy and then also at a future time, that would, if there is ever development, Steamboat Lake would have to be extended to so south down to the other extension of Steamboat Lake. Basically. And then those three properties that I think he's specifically talking on the east side are actually really in the township. And so we don't have really that much control yeah. over that at the moment. So. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Um, is Mr. Loomis here? Mr. Loomis, are you here? My name is Mike Polarski. I live on 923 Aspen Lane. I have the same concerns as Roger. I think you're trying to cram all these little lots in there to satisfy the builder. There's only one way in, one way out. Yeah, all this traffic with nowhere to go. Not to mention the emergency standpoint, if something goes wrong, there's only one way in and out of there. I just, uh, I don't know. My lot's four-tenths of an acre. Most of the the whole development was that big, and now I feel like you're trying to downsize to get all these homes in there. I don't think it's right. So, I mean, Roger got cut off on his time. I'll volunteer the rest of my time so he can state more of what the obvious is, but... We're pretty concerned about it. That's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dylan Jensen, D Y double L A N. I live at 920 Steamboat Lane on that nine house area that was discussed earlier. Uh, my concern with it being a dead end lot is there's a lot of young children in that in that area in those nine ten houses. Um, I have three that are four and under. Our neighbor has uh, one that's just, I think, seven or eight, and a younger one who has some special needs, and they have a young baby as well. If we're going to add on 14 houses to the area, how much more traffic and how many more people are not going to slow down around the corner? Or how much is that going to increase that in the safety of our children? Um, and maybe this doesn't apply to zoning, but uh, Regional Park is sitting up there at the end of that road too in that area. Is this going to push the city then, if this is, goes through, to start developing that park for these kids too? Thank you. 
Any other comments, concerns? I, I can just comment on the regional park, just so you know. The plan for that has always been to develop it over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, we are starting, we are applying for a grant to start by putting a park shelter out there. Um, we'll be applying for that in March, but just so people are aware, that's the plan is to develop that over the next 10 to 20 years because it's going to be quite costly. And so we're slowly saving for that. And we've been um, levying for that. Mm -hmm. okay. Is Mr. Loomis here? Yeah, is there anything you'd like to say or? No, we're pretty much right. Thanks. <coughs> discussed everything with uh, city staff, with their engineer and everything. Okay. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing and reopen the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. All in favor? Aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 We'll uh, close the second public hearing at 7.28 and open the planning and zoning meeting. Any discussion? Um, I guess my question is, is the lot sizes that they're talking about, those are all in the, where the houses are and all the distance to the property lines that, the, that they're proposing are all within our guidelines or? Mr. Cuff, can you please pick your microphone up and turn it on and talk into that? What's that? Your microphone. Oh. Can you please pick that up? Thank you. Oh, sure. Push it. Push the button. Sounds great. Thank you. I think it's. I think the Thank battery's you. almost dead. Oh, it's green. Okay. Uh, my my question is just is the what the builders are proposing are those lot sizes um, within all the guidelines that we have and the setbacks and all that stuff. On page twenty eight, it goes over that they're considerably smaller. Uh, so these would not be R1 zoning standards. This is uh, utilizing a PUD, which is to allow them to get flexibility from the zoning standards. So this is them asking you for permission, essentially, to have this flexibility from the zoning um, rules to allow for the standard, uh, which in this case, they're asking for a lot area, a lot with in a side yard setback. So they're asking for a reducement from what the standard is for an R1 zone. Okay. If that makes sense. And I was part of the original planning and zoning that plotted that for 14. And cutting it down this, this much, we've had two fires in the developments in uh, Parkview. And even with the 10 feet apart, there was damage to the adjacent building before the fire department could get there. You put them five feet on each side, that's 10 feet, maybe a little bit less with the overhangs. That's, in my book, that isn't going to work. And I do have to comment that not every one of them is five and five. Most of them are five and seven. And so that would be a little bit more. I am just had to clarify on that. Okay. What's state code? Isn't there a state code on that? Sorry. State code? The IRC? Um, if a state code, if the building was within five feet of each other, I believe it would have to put in a uh, firewall, essentially. But... For five okay. and five, no, I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, I'm just telling you that some of the side yard setbacks are five feet at minimum on one side and seven feet on the other on the other side. So it would be 12 feet for some of the units. Um, and two of the units I do believe are 20 feet apart because they have 10 and 10 on the side setbacks. Yeah, with the west winds out here that. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Okay, I'd be looking for a motion to uh, put either a yes or no on the PUD for uh, Loomis development. Motion either way. As you're, as you're thinking about it, um, and you correct me if I misspeak, but um, as you're thinking about it, just remember that that is why um, they do apply 
um, to for PUD because PUDs do have these smaller setbacks. Um, right. It doesn't necessarily have to be for a setback for anything. It could just be for any other flexibility that yes. they're wishing in design or something like that. And it's not uncommon for these to be approved in, in cities. Now, I will say that the recent developments throughout the Twin Cities area and further out are leading towards smaller lot sizes in general just due to the housing demand that is coming up. So, so I just wanted to give you that well. food for thought so that you're aware. Okay, still looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, not consider the PUD for this site. Do I hear a second? Did you say not to not do not it? To not to do it. Yeah, I would second that. Okay. I mean, they can still build and build on normal size lots, and can't they? Yeah, it's still if, plotted. If they want to follow the, they just have less houses, right? That would be up to the applicant if they wish to move forward on that. What's that? That would be up to them if they want to move forward on that. Yeah, they own the land, right? So, um, that's getting up to the applicant. I do believe Gary Brummer owns the land, and he's they're doing that on their own with him. So, okay. Yeah, I'll second that then. Okay, all in favor of not approving this? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Four zero. <laughs> just, just so you know, they only make a recommendation to the city council. The city council makes the final decision. So I just want you to be well aware of that. Okay. Are these houses in that neighborhood? Yeah, we just make recommendations to the city council. They can still change their minds. The houses that are there now. Um, yeah, like recommend yeah, that. These, Oh, yeah, yeah. 2,000 square feet. Out. If you're uh, yeah, so like, really against it, be at the next city council house. meeting to voice that. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll be, it'll be presented at the March 8th city council meeting. Yeah, we'll right. No, you won't get, it won't be a public hearing, so you won't get another notice. March 8th. Here? March 8th. Oh, March 8th. 7 o'clock, yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any old business? No. Yeah, they should just continue. Okay. New business. City planner updates. Uh, the only update that I would have would be that I believe Trollstead with the Casey's property is hoping to apply for this next coming month. Um, that and the preserve is still moving forward. We're still waiting on the applicant. Um, they're working with that. I don't have any other updates other than that. that update please sure um. <laughs> uh, yeah uh, so we're working with Matt Trellstead on the Casey's property he's hoping to submit an application for next month um, and then regarding the preserve the applicant is still working through all of the things that they want to do with the property before they submit an application and then I guess one other update would be we haven't heard anything uh, regarding the subway proposal but we do hope to hear back from them in the future we'll see Okay. And and our public works director did say that um, the Brever Group has contacted him to start looking at the testing out there. Okay. Okay. Um, go ahead. And next is considering um, for planning and zoning commissioner. We have an application from Mr. Roger Frauman. Yes, in your amended agenda packet, which was at your seats tonight, we did get, receive an application from Mr. Roger Frauman to join the Planning and Zoning Commission. And once again, we need you to consider that. Mr. Frauman is here if you have any questions. Um, and you will make a recommendation again to the City Council, and then they would make a decision at their March 8th meeting. Okay. So if you approve of him being on, you just have to make a motion and a second to recommend to the city council to appoint him. Okay. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Froman? 
I do not have any questions for Mr. Froman. What uh, what exactly does it say on your background there? Twelve plus year, twelve years. I can't read the rest of it. That's a FEMA disaster. Okay, thank you. A bunch of other hats, yeah. major disasters, uh, everything from Wilma, Katrina, and Rita Lee, I, uh, Sandy, yeah. and before that, 20 plus years, high tech, NCR, IBM, three startups, and uh, before that, 12 years in the Thank you. Thank you for your service. Okay, I'd be looking for a motion to uh, approve Mr. Froman's application for recommendation. I'll make a motion to approve Roger uh, Froman's application. Here a second. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, welcome aboard, well, hopefully. Okay, next meeting is Wednesday, March 10th, 2021. will be held right here at the Montrose Community Center at 7 p.m. Uh, look for a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, close the meeting at... 739. Thank you.